Chapter 12. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 12 of The House of the Seven Gables by Nathaniel Hawthorne. Read by Nicodemus. The Daguerreotypist. It must not be supposed that the life of a personage naturally so active as Phoebe could be wholly confined within the precincts of the old pension house. Clifford's demands upon her time were usually satisfied, in those long days, considerably earlier than sunset. Quiet as his daily existence seemed, it nevertheless drained all the resources by which he lived. It was not physical exercise that overwearied him, for except that he sometimes wrought a little with the hoe, or paced the garden walk, or in rainy weather traversed a large unoccupied room, it was his tendency to remain only too quiescent, as regarded any toil of the limbs and muscles. But either there was a smouldering fire within him that consumed his vital energy, or the monotony that would have dragged itself with benumbing effect over a mind differently situated was no monotony to Clifford. Possibly he was in a state of second growth and recovery, and was constantly assimilating nutriment for his spirit and intellect from sights, sounds, and events which passed as a perfect void to persons more practised with the world. As all is activity and vicissitude to the new mind of a child, so might it be likewise to a mind that had undergone a kind of new creation after its long suspended life. Be the cause what it might, Clifford commonly retired to rest, thoroughly exhausted, while the sunbeams were still melting through his window curtains, or were thrown with late luster on the chamber wall. And while he thus slept early, as other children do, and dreamed of childhood, Phoebe was free to follow her own tastes for the remainder of the day and evening. This was a freedom essential to the health even of a character so little susceptible of morbid influences as that of Phoebe. The old house, as we have already said, had both the dry rot and the damp rot in its walls. It was not good to breathe no other atmosphere than that. Hepzibah, though she had her valuable and redeeming traits, had grown to be a kind of lunatic, by imprisoning herself so long in one place, with no other company than a single series of ideas, and but one affection, and one bitter sense of wrong. Clifford, the reader may perhaps imagine, was too inert to operate morally on his fellow creatures, however intimate and exclusive their relations with him. But the sympathy or magnetism among human beings is more subtle and universal than we think. It exists, indeed, among different classes of organized life, and vibrates from one to another. A flower, for instance, as Phoebe herself observed, always began to droop sooner in Clifford's hand, or Hepzibah's, than in her own, and by the same law, converting her whole daily life into a flower fragrance for these two sickly spirits, the blooming girl must inevitably droop and fade much sooner than if worn on a younger and happier breast. Unless she had now and then indulged her brisk impulses, and breathed rural air in a suburban walk or ocean breezes along the shore, had occasionally obeyed the impulse of nature in New England girls by attending a metaphysical or philosophical lecture, or viewing a seven-mile panorama, or listening to a concert, had gone shopping about the city, ransacking entire depots of splendid merchandise, and bringing home a ribbon, had employed likewise a little time to read the Bible in her chamber, and had stolen a little more to think of her mother and her native place, unless for such moral medicines as the above, we should soon have beheld our poor Phoebe grow thin and put on a bleached, unwholesome aspect, and assume strange, shy ways, prophetic of old maidenhood and a cheerless future. Even as it was, a change grew visible, a change partly to be regretted, although whatever charm it infringed upon was repaired by another, perhaps more precious. She was not so constantly gay, but had her moods of thought, which Clifford on the whole liked better than her former phase of unmingled cheerfulness, because now she understood him better and more delicately, and sometimes even interpreted him to himself. Her eyes looked larger and darker and deeper, so deep at some silent moments that they seemed like artesian wells, down, down into the infinite. She was less girlish than when we first beheld her alighting from the omnibus, less girlish but more a woman. 
the only youthful mind with which Phoebe had an opportunity of frequent intercourse was that of the daguerreotypist. Inevitably, by the pressure of the seclusion about them, they had been brought into habits of some familiarity. Had they met under different circumstances, neither of these young persons would have been likely to bestow much thought upon the other, unless, indeed, their extreme dissimilarity should have proved a principle of mutual attraction. Both, it is true, were characters proper to New England life, and possessing a common ground, therefore, in their more external developments, but as unlike in their respective interiors as if their native climes had been at worldwide distance. During the early part of their acquaintance, Phoebe had held back rather more than was customary with her frank and simple manners from Holgrave's not very marked advances, nor was she yet satisfied that she knew him well, although they almost daily met and talked together in a kind, friendly, and what seemed to be a familiar way. The artist, in a desultory manner, had imparted to Phoebe something of his history. Young as he was, and had his career terminated at the point already attained, there had been enough of incident to fill, very creditably, an autobiographic volume. A romance on the plan of Gil Blas, adapted to American society and manners, would cease to be a romance. The experience of many individuals among us who think it hardly worth the telling would equal the vicissitudes of the Spaniards' earlier life, while their ultimate success, or the point whither they tend, may be incomparably higher than any that a novelist would imagine for his hero. Holgrave, as he told Phoebe somewhat proudly, could not boast of his origin, unless as being exceedingly humble, nor of his education, except that it had been the scantiest possible and obtained by a few winter months' attendance at a district school. Left early to his own guidance, he had begun to be self-dependent while yet a boy, and it was a condition aptly suited to his natural force of will. Though now but twenty years old, lacking some months which are years in such a life, he had already been first a country schoolmaster, next a salesman in a country store, and either at the same time or afterwards the political editor of a country newspaper. He had subsequently traveled New England and the Middle States as a peddler, in the employment of a Connecticut manufactory of cologne water and other essences. In an episodical way he had studied and practiced dentistry, and with very flattering success, especially in many of the factory towns along our inland streams. As a supernumerary official, of some kind or other, aboard a packet ship, he had visited Europe, and found means before his return to see Italy and part of France and Germany. At a later period he had spent some months in a community of Fourierus. Still more recently he had been a public lecturer on mesmerism, for which science, as he assured Phoebe, and indeed satisfactorily proved, by putting Chanticleer, who happened to be scratching nearby to sleep, he had very remarkable endowments. His present phase as a daguerreotypist was of no more importance in his own view, nor likely to be more permanent than any of the preceding ones. It had been taken up with the careless alacrity of an adventurer, who had his bread to earn. It would be thrown aside as carelessly whenever he should choose to earn his bread by some other equally digressive means. But what was more remarkable, and perhaps showed a more than common poise in the young man, was the fact that, amid all these personal vicissitudes, he had never lost his identity. Homeless as he had been, continually changing his whereabout, and therefore responsible neither to public opinion nor to individuals, putting off one exterior and snatching up another to be soon shifted for a third, he had never violated the innermost man, but had carried his conscience along with him. It was impossible to know Holgrave without recognizing this to be the fact. Hepzibah had seen it. Phoebe soon saw it likewise, and gave him the sort of confidence which such a certainty inspires. She was startled, however, and sometimes repelled, not by any doubt of his integrity to whatever law he acknowledged, but by a sense that his law differed from her own. He made her uneasy, and seemed to unsettle everything around her by his lack of reverence for what was fixed, unless, at a moment's warning, it could establish its right to hold its ground. Then, moreover, she scarcely thought him affectionate in his nature. He was too calm and cool an observer. Phoebe felt his eye often, 
his heart seldom or never. He took a certain kind of interest in Hepzibah and her brother, and Phoebe herself. He studied them attentively, and allowed no slightest circumstance of their individualities to escape him. He was ready to do them whatever good he might, but after all he never exactly made common cause with them, nor gave any reliable evidence that he loved them better in proportion as he knew them more. In his relations with them he seemed to be in quest of mental food, not heart sustenance. Phoebe could not conceive what interested him so much in her friends and herself, intellectually, since he cared nothing for them, or comparatively so little as objects of human affection. Always in his interviews with Phoebe, the artist made a special inquiry as to the welfare of Clifford, whom, except at the Sunday festival, he seldom saw. "'Does he still seem happy?' he asked one day. "'As happy as a child,' answered Phoebe, "'but, like a child, too, very easily disturbed.' "'How disturbed?' inquired Holgrave. "'By things without, or by thoughts within?' "'I cannot see his thoughts. How should I?' replied Phoebe, with simple piquancy. Very often his humor changes without any reason that can be guessed at, just as a cloud comes over the sun. Latterly, since I have begun to know him better, I feel it to be not quite right to look closely into his moods. He has had such a great sorrow that his heart is made all solemn and sacred by it. When he is cheerful, when the sun shines into his mind, then I venture to peep in, just as far as the light reaches, but no further. It is holy ground where the shadow falls. How prettily you express this sentiment, said the artist. I can understand the feeling without possessing it. Had I your opportunities, no scruples would prevent me from fathoming Clifford to the full depth of my plummet line. How strange that you should wish it, remarked Phoebe involuntarily. What is Cousin Clifford to you? Oh, nothing, of course, nothing, answered Holgrave with a smile. Only this is such an odd and incomprehensible world. The more I look at it, the more it puzzles me, and I begin to suspect that a man's bewilderment is the measure of his wisdom. Men and women, and children too, are such strange creatures that one never can be certain that he really knows them, nor ever guess what they have been from what he sees them to be now. Judge Pension, Clifford, what a complex riddle, a complexity of complexities, do they present. It requires intuitive sympathy, like a young girl's, to solve it. A mere observer like myself, who never had any intuitions, and am at best only subtle and acute, is pretty certain to go astray. The artist now turned the conversation to themes less dark than that which they had touched upon. Phoebe and he were young together, nor had Holgrave, in his premature experience of life, wasted entirely that beautiful spirit of youth which, gushing forth from one small heart and fancy, may diffuse itself over the universe, making it all as bright as on the first day of creation. Man's own youth is the world's youth, at least he feels as if it were, and imagines that the earth's granite substance is something not yet hardened, and which he can mould into whatever shape he likes. So it was with Holgrave. He could talk sagely about the world's old age, but never actually believed what he said. He was a young man still, and therefore looked upon the world, that grey-bearded and wrinkled profligate, decrepit without being venerable, as a tender stripling, capable of being improved into all that it ought to be, but scarcely yet had shown the remotest promise of becoming. He had that sense or inward prophecy, which a young man had better never have been born than not to have, and a mature man had better die at once than utterly to relinquish, that we are not doomed to creep on for ever in the old bad way but that this very now there are the harbingers abroad of a golden era to be accomplished in his own lifetime. It seemed to Holgrave, as doubtless it has seemed to the hopeful of every century since the epoch of Adam's grandchildren, that in this age, more than ever before, the moss-grown and rotten past is to be torn down, and lifeless institutions to be thrust out of the way, and their dead corpses buried, and everything to begin anew. As to the main point, may we never live to doubt it, as to the better centuries that are coming, the artist was surely right. His error lay in supposing that this age, more than any past or future one, is destined to see the tattered garments of antiquity exchanged for a new suit, instead of gradually renewing themselves by patchwork. 
in applying his own little lifespan as the measure of an interminable achievement, and more than all, in fancying that it mattered anything to the great end in view whether he himself should contend for it or against it. Yet it was well for him to think so. This enthusiasm, infusing itself through the calmness of his character, and thus taking an aspect of settled thought and wisdom, would serve to keep his youth pure and make his aspirations high. And when, with the years settling down more weightily upon him, his early faith should be modified by inevitable experience, it would be with no harsh and sudden revolution of his sentiments. He would still have faith in man's brightening destiny, and perhaps love him all the better, as he should recognize his helplessness in his own behalf. And the haughty faith with which he began life would be well bartered for a far humbler one at its close, in discerning that man's best directed effort accomplishes a kind of dream while God is the sole worker of realities. Holgrave had read very little, and that little in passing through the thoroughfare of life, where the mystic language of books was necessarily mixed up with the babble of the multitude, so that both one and the other were apt to lose any sense that might have been properly their own. He considered himself a thinker, and was certainly of a thoughtful turn, but with his own path to discover had perhaps hardly yet reached the point where an educated man begins to think. The true value of his character lay in that deep consciousness of inward strength, which made all his past vicissitudes seem merely like a change of garments, and that enthusiasm, so quiet that he scarcely knew of its existence, but which gave a warmth to everything that he laid his hand on, and that personal ambition, hidden from his own as well as other eyes among his more generous impulses, but in which lurked a certain efficacy that might solidify him from a theorist into the champion of some practical cause. Altogether, in his culture and want of culture, in his crude, wild, and misty philosophy, and the practical experience that counteracted some of his tendencies, and his magnanimous zeal for man's welfare, and his recklessness of whatever the ages had established in man's behalf, in his faith and in his infidelity, in what he had and in what he lacked, the artist might fitly enough stand forth as the representative of many compeers in his native land. His career it would be difficult to prefigure. There appeared to be qualities in Holgrave, such as, in a country where everything is free to hand that can grasp it, could hardly fail to put some of the world's prizes within his reach. But these matters are delightfully uncertain. At almost every step in life we meet with young men of just about Holgrave's age, for whom we anticipate wonderful things, but of whom, even after much and careful inquiry, we never happen to hear another word. The effervescence of youth and passion, and the fresh gloss of the intellect and imagination, endow them with a false brilliancy, which makes fools of themselves and other people. Like certain chintzes, calicoes, and ginghams, they show finely in their first newness, but cannot stand the sun and rain, and assume a very sober aspect after washing day. But our business is with Holgrave as we find him on this particular afternoon, and in the arbor of the pension garden. In that point of view, it was a pleasant sight to behold this young man, with so much faith in himself, and so fair an appearance of admirable powers, so little harm, too, by the many tests that had tried his mettle. It was pleasant to see him in this kindly intercourse with Phoebe. Her thought had scarcely done him justice when it pronounced him cold, or if so, he had grown warmer now. Without such purpose on her part, and unconsciously on his, she made the house of the Seven Gables like a home to him, and the garden a familiar precinct. With the insight on which he prided himself, he fancied that he could look through Phoebe and all around her, and could read her off like a page of a child's story-book. But these transparent natures are often deceptive in their depth. Those pebbles at the bottom of the fountain are farther from us than we think. Thus the artist, whatever he might judge of Phoebe's capacity, was beguiled, by some silent charm of hers, to talk freely of what he dreamed of doing in the world. He poured himself out as to another self. Very possibly he forgot Phoebe while he talked to her, and was moved only by the inevitable tendency of thought, when rendered sympathetic by enthusiasm and emotion, to flow into the first safe reservoir which it finds. But had you peeped at them through the chinks of the garden fence, the young man's earnestness and heightened color might have led you to suppose that he was making love to the young girl. 
At length something was said by Holgrave that made it apposite for Phoebe to inquire what had first brought him acquainted with her cousin Hepzibah, and why he now chose to lodge in the desolate old pension house. Without directly answering her, he turned from the future, which had heretofore been the theme of his discourse, and began to speak of the influences of the past. One subject, indeed, is but the reverberation of the other. "'Shall we never, never get rid of this past?' cried he, keeping up the earnest tone of his preceding conversation. "'It lies upon the present, like a giant's dead body. In fact, the case is just as if a young giant were compelled to waste all his strength in carrying about the corpse of the old giant, his grandfather, who died a long while ago, and only needs to be decently buried. Just think a moment, and it will startle you to see what slaves we are to bygone times, to death, if we give the matter the right word.' "'But I do not see it,' observed Phoebe. "'For example, then,' continued Holgrave, "'a dead man, if he happens to have made a will, "'disposes of wealth no longer his own, "'or if he die intestate, "'it is distributed in accordance with the notions of men "'much longer dead than he. "'A dead man sits on all our judgment seats, "'and living judges do but search out and repeat his decisions. "'We read in dead men's books, "'we laugh at dead men's jokes.' and cry at dead men's pathos. We are sick of dead men's diseases, physical and moral, and die of the same remedies with which dead doctors killed their patients. We worship the living deity according to dead men's forms and creeds. Whatever we seek to do of our own free motion, a dead man's icy hand obstructs us. Turn our eyes to what point we may, a dead man's white, immitigable face encounters them, and freezes our very heart and we must be dead ourselves before we can begin to have our proper influence on our own world, which will then be no longer our world, but the world of another generation, with which we shall have no shadow of a right to interfere. I ought to have said, too, that we live in dead men's houses, as, for instance, in this of the Seven Gables. And why not, said Phoebe, so long as we can be comfortable in them? But we shall live to see the day, I trust, went on the artist, when no man shall build his house for posterity, why should he? He might just as reasonably order a durable suit of clothes, leather or gutta percha, or whatever else lasts longest, so that his great-grandchildren should have the benefit of them, and cut precisely the same figure in the world that he himself does. If each generation were allowed and expected to build its own houses, that single change, comparatively unimportant in itself, would imply almost every reform which society is now suffering for. I doubt whether even our public edifices, our capitals, state houses, court houses, city hall, and churches, ought to be built of such permanent materials as stone or brick. It were better that they should crumble to ruin once in twenty years, or thereabouts, as a hint to the people to examine into and reform the institutions which they symbolize. "'How you hate everything old!' said Phoebe in dismay. "'It makes me dizzy to think of such a shifting world.' "'I certainly love nothing mouldy,' answered Holgrave. "'Now this old pension house, is it a wholesome place to live in, "'with its black shingles and the green moss that shows how damp they are? "'Its dark, low-studded rooms, its grime and sordidness, "'which are the crystallization on its walls of the human breath "'that has been drawn and exhaled here in discontent and anguish?' The house ought to be purified with fire, purified till only its ashes remain. "'Then why do you live in it?' asked Phoebe, a little piqued. "'Oh, I am pursuing my studies here. Not in books, however,' replied Holgrave. "'The house, in my view, is expressive of that odious and abominable past, with all its bad influences, against which I have just been declaiming. I dwell in it for a while, that I may know the better how to hate it. By the by, did you ever hear the story of Maul, the wizard, and what happened between him and your immeasurably great-grandfather? Yes, indeed, said Phoebe. I heard it long ago from my father, and two or three times from my cousin Hepzibah in the month that I have been here. She seems to think that all the calamities of the pensions began from that quarrel with the wizard, as you call him. And you, Mr. Holgrave, look as you thought so, too. How singular that you should believe what is so very absurd! when you reject many things that are a great deal worthier of credit. "'I do believe it,' said the artist seriously. "'Not as a superstition, however, 
but as proved by unquestionable facts, and as exemplifying a theory. Now, see under those seven gables at which we now look up, and which old Colonel Pension meant to be the house of his descendants, in prosperity and happiness, down to an epoch far beyond the present. Under that roof, through a portion of three centuries, there has been perpetual remorse of conscience, a constantly defeated hope, strife amongst kindred, various misery, a strange form of death, dark suspicion, unspeakable disgrace, all, or most of which calamity, I have the means of tracing to the old Puritan's inordinate desire to plant and endow a family. To plant a family. This idea is at the bottom of most of the wrong and mischief which men do. The truth is that once in every half-century, at longest, a family should be merged into the great obscure mass of humanity, and forget all about its ancestors. Human blood, in order to keep its freshness, should run in hidden streams, as the water of an aqueduct is conveyed in subterranean pipes. In the family existence of these pensions, for instance, forgive me, Phoebe, but I cannot think of you as one of them, in their brief New England pedigree, there has been time enough to infect them all with one kind of lunacy or another. "'You speak very unceremoniously of my kindred,' said Phoebe, debating with herself whether she ought to take offence. "'I speak true thoughts to a true mind,' answered Holgrave, with a vehemence which Phoebe had not before witnessed in him. "'The truth is as I say. Furthermore, the original perpetrator and father of this mischief appears to have perpetuated himself, and still walks the street, at least his very image in mind and body, with the fairest prospect of transmitting to posterity as rich and as wretched an inheritance as he has received. Do you remember the daguerreotype and its resemblance to the old portrait? How strangely in earnest you are, exclaimed Phoebe, looking at him with surprise and perplexity, half alarmed and partly inclined to laugh. You talk of the lunacy of the pensions. Is it contagious? I understand you, said the artist, coloring and laughing. I believe I am a little mad. This subject has taken hold of my mind with the strangest tenacity of clutch since I have lodged in yonder gable. As one method of throwing it off, I have put an incident of the pension family history with which I happen to be acquainted into the form of a legend and mean to publish it in a magazine. Do you write for the magazines? inquired Phoebe. Is it possible you do not know it? cried Holgrave. Well, such is literary fame. Yes, Miss Phoebe Pension, among the multitude of my marvellous gifts I have that of writing stories, and my name has figured, I can assure you, on the covers of Graham and Godey, making as respectable an appearance, for aught I could see, as any of the canonized bread roll with which it was associated. And the humorous line, I am thought to have a very pretty way with me, and as for pathos, I am as provocative of tears as an onion. But shall I read you my story? Yes, if it is not very long, said Phoebe, and added laughingly, nor very dull. As this latter point was one which the daguerreotypist could not decide for himself, he forthwith produced his roll of manuscript, and while the late sunbeams gilded the seven gables, began to read. End of chapter 12 of The House of the Seven Gables by Nathaniel Hawthorne Read by Nicodemus.